Okay, we're going to begin our lectures today on the biological basis of mental life. Psychology was defined at the very beginning of the existence of the science by William James as the science of mental life. As I described last time, James argued that the whole purpose of psychology is to try to understand the cognitive, emotional, and motivational processes that underlie human experience, thought, and action. But because the brain is the physical basis of the mind, the, the mind is what the brain does, James began his uh, famous treatise on psychology with a discussion of brain function, setting a precedent that's followed almost universally in introductory courses for the next more than a century of beginning the course with some discussion of the biological basis of the, uh, of the mind. The study of the mind includes the study of mind and body, and that means the study of the brain. Now, the nervous system is a biological structure, and as you remember from your high school biology, biological structures are hierarchically organized. We begin at the cell level, which you all remember is the uh, smallest, most elementary piece of, the, of uh, living matter that can live independently. Cells, groups of related cells combine to form tissues. Groups of related tissues combine to form organs. Groups of related organs combine to form systems. And there are a whole bunch of different systems that make up the individual human organism. For humans and most other animals as well, there are a bunch of different systems in the body. The nervous system is only one of them. There's the endocrine system and the musculoskeletal system and the respiratory system and all of that. We're going to be con concerned uh, in these lectures with the nervous system pretty exclusively, but as your textbook makes clear, there are other, the, the nervous system is connected to other systems, okay? And uh, particularly interesting are the connections between the nervous system on the one hand and the immune and the endocrine systems on the, uh, on the other hand. Okay, so the nervous system is one such system, and as a biological system, it too is hierarchical, hierarchically organized. At the cell level, we have these structures known as neurons, okay? Neurons are the elementary structures in the nervous system. Then we have groups of neurons combining the tissue level to, come to form somewhat larger structures known as nerves and ganglia and nuclei. I'll describe those a little bit more in a moment. Then bunches of nerves and ganglia and nuclei form at the organ level the major structures of the nervous system, the brain, the spinal cord, and the brain stem. And at the system level, it turns out that there are not, there's not just one nervous system, but there are several different nervous systems. The nervous system itself is hierarchically organized. We can distinguish at the outset between the central nervous system, which consists of the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which consists of two other nervous systems known as the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. Basically, the peripheral nervous system, although that part of the nervous system that connects to the central uh, nervous system. And then all of this stuff, these, di these different aspects of the nervous system combine with the other uh, bodily systems to create the organism as the individual person. Okay? So here's what a neuron looks like. This is a schematic diagram of a neuron. There are lots of different kinds of neurons. They come in somewhat different shapes and sizes but they all have these same kinds of, uh, of structures associated with them. There is a cell body with these structures known as dendrites branching out from the cell body. Then there is a long filament-like uh, axon, and then the axon ends in what are known as terminal endings, which kind of look like dendrites uh, in, uh, in reverse. Neurons come in three basic types. There are first afferent neurons, which uh, process sensory information, basically carry neural impulses from the sensory receptors in the 
uh, ear or the uh, nose or the eye or whatever in toward the central nervous system. Then there are efferent neurons which carry motor impulses out from the central nervous system to the effector organs of the body like the muscles and the tendons and the internal organs and so on. And then there are interneurons which comprise the central nervous system, uh, large parts of the spinal cord uh, and the brain and the brainstem. So whether you're an afferent neuron handling sensory functions, an efferent neuron handling motor functions, or an interneuron running between the afferent and the efferent neurons, uh, this is the basic structure all neurons look alike from this point of view. A cell body with dendrites branching off, an axon connecting to terminal, uh, terminal fibers. Okay. As far as behavior is concerned, the smallest unit in the nervous system is what's known as the reflex arc. The reflex arc is kind of an abstract term. There isn't actually such a thing in the nervous system, but you get the idea when you, when you consider that the reflex arc consists of at one afferent neuron processing sensory activities, processing sensation, one efferent neuron processing bodily responses, and one interneuron connecting the afferent neuron with the efferent neuron. The reflex arc, you'll see an application of this uh, in, a, in a larger uh, the scale in a couple of minutes. Uh, but basically, what the reflex arc does is to mediate the organism's motor response to an environmental stimulus. To pick up through the sensory neuron, the afferent neuron, information about what's going on in the environment, process it through the interneuron, connects it to the efferent neuron, which uh, generates some kind of response to that environmental event. And it turns out that the larger structures in the nervous system are composed of variously afferent, efferent, and interneurons. So all the nerves, the nerves in your arms and your uh, legs and, and elsewhere, are composed of afferent and efferent neurons. That's what nerves are made out of. And then we have these other structures known as ganglia and nuclei, which are composed of interneurons, okay, more central uh, tissue. The distinction, which I don't think I've ever held anybody responsible for, but you will see these terms in the literature. Ganglia, the term ganglia generally refers to cl uh, clusters of interneurons that reside outside the brain and the spinal cord, whereas nuclei refer to uh, clusters of interneurons that reside inside the brain and the spinal cord. Okay? The basic level of the nervous system, three kinds of neurons. Afferent neurons, processing sensory information. Efferent neurons, processing motor information. Interneurons connecting the two, the three types of neurons together comprising the reflex arc, which processes a uh, response to an environmental stimulus. And then the, the tissue level, you have nerves composed of afferent or efferent neurons and nuclei and ganglia composed of, uh, of interneurons. Okay? So now let's move up one level from the tissue level, closer to the organ level, and look at the major divisions of the nervous system. I've already introduced this to you uh, 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 in an earlier slide, but just to repeat myself, the major division of the nervous system is between the central nervous system on the one hand and the peripheral nervous system on the other hand. The central nervous system consisting of the brain, the spinal cord, and the brain stem, which connects them. The peripheral nervous system consisting of two subordinate nervous systems, the somatic nervous system, which runs between the central nervous system and the sensory receptors in the ear, the nose, the throat, the eye, and also efferent neurons that run to the muscles and tendons in the, in the body. And then finally, there is an autonomic nervous system which connects the central nervous system to the internal organs, com uh, uh, controls the functioning of the heart, the lungs, and other kinds of uh, organs. You can turn that light down a little bit if you want. 
or not. Okay, so now let's work on the autonomic nervous system and see how it's organized. You're going to get a picture here of what we, this is hierarchical organization to the ninth degree because it turns out that there are two components to the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is that part of the autonomic nervous system that organizes the body to meet emergencies. When a stressful event occurs, when a surprising event occurs, when anything unexpected occurs, what happens is that the sympathetic nervous system kicks in to uh, uh, enable the organism to deal with whatever is going on. First, the sympathetic nervous system uh, mediates what's known as the flight or fight response. Usually, especially if you're a little animal wandering around, um, what you're trying to do is either defend your territory against other animals of your species, or you're trying to prevent yourself from being eaten by bigger animals of another species. And the, um, the sympathetic nervous system uh, mediates that flight or fight response. Uh, that's a classic uh, term that's been in the literature since the 19-teens. More recently, we've discovered another emergency response that's mediated by the sympathetic nervous system, which is what's known as tend and befriend. Uh, some, uh, in, in some organisms, it's the male of the species that prepares for flight or fight. The female of the species tends to engage in what's called tendon for befriending behavior, either looking to the young uh, or providing uh, a support uh, for, another, uh, for another animal. Again, that's a, uh, more or less a sex difference uh, that you find in some, uh, in some mammalian species. Uh, but whether you're a male or female of the rat or mouse or cat or dog species, the sympathetic nervous system uh, also has the function of generating emotional arousal. And it does that by stimulating the flow of a hormone, adrenaline, through the bloodstream to the various uh, internal organs. So it, uh, the sympathetic arousal um, helps the organism meet emergencies, but it also produces uh, the uh, arousal of the various emotions. And through the release of another hormone, noradrenaline, it releases sugar, stored uh, bodily sugars, into the bloodstream. And of course, those, bottle, those uh, blood sugars go right to the muscles and enable the organism to engage in fight or flight, tend to befriend more effectively. Uh, so um, the last thing the sympathetic nervous system does when it's activated is to rechannel the flow of the blood away from the surface of the body towards the internal organs, and that has the effect of um, uh, reducing blood loss in case you're wounded, in case you don't make it in the flight or fight uh, response. So uh, when there is, it's a sympathetic branch of the uh, autonomic nervous system that does all these things, basically uh, engaging in emotional arousal and uh, various behaviors that allow the organism to meet emergencies. The parasympathetic nervous system, by contrast, basically is engaged in um, uh, mediating vegetative functions of various kinds. It's the parasympathetic nervous system that handles things like digestion of food, elimination of waste, reproductive behaviors, and so on. Sympathetic nervous system, emotional arousal, flight or fight, tend to befriend, parasympathetic nervous system uh, uh, basically mediates vegetative functions of the body. That's not quite all there is to it, however, because it turns out that the parasympathetic nervous system is also involved in the organism's response to stressors, response to emergencies, but the uh, parasympathetic nervous system only comes into play in emergencies in response to uh, arousal of the sympathetic nervous system. It turns out that when the organism reacts to stress, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems act in a kind of antagonistic manner. They basically pull the organism in opposite uh, directions. So for example, let's look at uh, sympathetic activity. 
when you're, uh, when you're uh, exposed to some kind of stressor. The sympathetic nervous system dilates the pupils of the eye, inhibits tearing, inhibits salivation. When you're nervous, your eyes get wide and your mouth gets dry. Uh, it inhibits stomach con contractions, uh, relaxes the bladder, you really get nervous, you might wet yourself, uh, inhibits uh, uh, genital erections and so on. But look what the parasympathetic uh, system does. When the sympathetic nervous system is dilating the pupils of the eye, the parasympathetic nervous system is constricting the pupils of the eye. When the sympathetic nervous system is inhibiting salivation, the parasympathetic uh, system is, uh, is um, stimulating uh, salivation. So what happens here is that when you're stressed, when you, uh, when you encounter some stressful event in the environment, the first thing that happens is that the sympathetic nervous system kicks in and it does all these things at once. It acts as a unit with a very rapid onset, comes on very quickly, okay, and also has a very rapid offset. If you're a mouse running across the field and you see the shadow of a hawk, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in to enable you to go run from the hawk or whatever. As soon as the hawk is out of sight or whatever, what happens is that the sympathetic nervous system turns itself off very fast, okay? But what happens is all this sympathetic nervous system uh, activity, flight, fight, tend, befriend, releasing stored blood sugars, all that stuff, depletes bodily resources. And so you've got to have some system that will act to restore those resources for the next emer emergency that comes around. And that's what the parasympathetic nervous system does in response to uh, an environmental stressor. The parasympathetic nervous system acts on discrete pieces of the body at once. It acts discriminatively only where it's really needed. Moreover, the parasympathetic nervous system has a relatively slow onset. The sympathetic nervous system has to kick in immediately or you're going to get eaten. Okay? But it's going to take you a while to, con to consume those bodily resources, so the sympathetic nervous system doesn't have to act so fast. Moreover, once the emergency is passed, you don't have to do anything, okay? But the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system has to continue to work for a while to restore the bodily resources that were depleted when you were meeting, uh, when you were, uh, meeting the, uh, the emergency. So what happens is when there's a stressful event, you're walking across campus, a gorilla jumps out of the bushes or something, your sympathetic nervous system kicks off uh, immediately, okay? And as you're running away from the gorilla, you know, parasympathetic nervous system will start working a little bit. Then when you're off, uh, safe from the animal, uh, your sympathetic nervous system turns itself off pretty quickly, but the parasympathetic nervous system keeps going for a while to get those bodily resources, those blood sugars and all that other stuff uh, going, um, going together. And that's why, for example, when you're exposed to some kind of acute stressor, when the stressor goes away, sometimes you feel like you've crashed a little bit, right? Well, that's because the, as the sympathetic nervous system is trying to wind you up, okay, the parasympathetic nervous system is trying to wind you down. The uh, antagonistic uh, uh, interplay of the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous systems, for example, uh, accounts for the funny uh, dynamics of addiction, okay, where uh, if you uh, ingest an, a, uh, uh, an addictive drug, you may feel good for a while, but then when the drug wears off, you don't just go back to normal, you crash, okay? You crash, that crash is mediated by the continuing activity of the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, so that's what I have to say right now about the autonomic nervous system basically has two functions, um, prepare, uh, mediating the organism's response to stress and also mediating various kinds of vegetative functions. Any questions about the autonomic nervous system right now? Okay, remember if you have questions about lectures or reading at any time, you can always post them to the course website and I'll, we'll, and I'll get to them. Okay, so that's the autonomic nervous system. Let's look at the somatic nervous system, okay? 
which consists of the nerves that run to nerves that run to and from the brain and the spinal cord. In fact, there are uh, 31 spinal nerves, so-called because they emanate from the spinal cord. These are all spinal nerves uh, here. And then there are 12 cranial nerves, so-called because they uh, uh, emanate from the brain or the, uh, or the brain stem. Uh, here is the vagus nerve, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, which actually comes out of the brain stem but goes into the trunk of the body. But that's basically what the somatic nervous system uh, looks like, those two major divisions, the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. The cranial nerves are highly specialized structures. They're highly specialized in terms of the functions they perform. There are some uh, cranial nerves that are exclusively afferent in nature. That is, they are devoted to processing sensory impulses arising from various sensory receptors and taking them toward the central nervous system. So, for example, you've got um, cranial nerve one, the so-called olfactory nerve that runs from the nose, essentially from the nose into the brain, and mediates the sense of smell. Cranial nerve two, the optic nerve, runs from the retinas of the eyes to the brain and mediates the sense of vision. So some of the cranial nerves, these are just two examples, are exclusively afferent in nature in that they mediate only sensory uh, impulses. By the same token, there are some nerves that are exclusively efferent in nature, which is to say that they're on the output side, they control motor, um, motor behaviors of various, uh, in various ways. Here's one, cranial nerve three, the oculomotor uh, nerve uh, moves the eyes. When you move your eyes back and forth, up and down, so on, uh, that's uh, all being done by the oculomotor nerve. Here's another one, uh, cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve, which has the um, uh, function of moving the tongue. So when you talk, when you eat, when you do some other stuff, you do it by virtue of the, uh, of the hypoglossal nerve. And then finally, just to make things a little confusing, there are some cranial nerves that are mixed in nature because they combine afferent and efferent functions. So cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, mediates the sense of touch around the face and the oral cavity. Um, so that, that's its afferent function, but its efferent function is to mediate chewing activity. When you chew on your food, uh, you're doing it by virtue of um, efferent impulses being carried by the trigeminal nerve. Here's another one, uh, uh, cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. Its afferent function is to mediate the sense of taste. Uh, connects the taste buds and other receptors in the tongue um, to the brain so that you can taste your food. And then the facial, uh, the facial nerve, um, uh, the seven, as an efferent nerve, um, mediates the movement of the face. When you smile, when you frown, when you scowl, when you do what you do with your face, uh, you do it by virtue of the efferent aspect of the, um, of the cranial nerve. Okay. So again, these cranial nerves are highly specialized. Some are exclusively afferent in nature. Some are exclusively efferent in nature. And others are mixed. By contrast, the spinal nerves all combine afferent and efferent sensory and motor functions. Uh, here is a uh, schematic diagram of uh, a nerve, a, a spinal nerve connecting to the, uh, the spinal cord, and most of you can probably see this, there are in fact two roots of this spinal nerve. Here is one root carrying sensory information from the receptors, from the sensory receptors in towards the spinal cord, and there is another root that is carrying efferent motor information uh, to, to generate a motor response, uh, uh, that's, it, that's the efferent part of the, um, of, the spinal, of, the, of the spinal nerve. Okay, so 
Um, basically, that's the idea. Okay, each of these spinal nerves combine afferent and efferent functions running along different branches and different pathways. Here are the 31 spinal nerves. You don't have to memorize this. This isn't a human anatomy course, but I do want you to have some sense of what the nervous system um, looks like. And one of the things you should notice is that there is a regular association between the part of the body that is served by a spinal nerve and where that spinal nerve connects to the spinal cord. So up here, you have the cervical division of the spinal cord, which basically uh, has um, uh, uh, nerves that run out to the arms and the hands and the, uh, and the fingers, okay, up here. Then there's the thoracic division, uh, which uh, the spinal nerves basically run to the internal organs of the body. And then down here, the lumbar and the sacral division and uh, the... Um, uh, uh, the others, which carry the nerves that operate the uh, legs and the, uh, and the feet. Okay, so first, there's a regular association between the part of the body served by a spinal nerve and where it connects to, to the spinal cord. The other interesting feature of the spinal nerves is that there is a kind of proportional representation. There are more spinal nerves devoted to those parts of the body that either need acute sensory function or fine motor control. So you've got lots of nerves that run to the arms and the hands and the fingers, and you've got lots of nerves that run to the legs and the feet and the toes, um, but not so many that run to the, uh, to the trunk and the chest cavity of the body. You've got more nerves where you need either fine sensitivity, fine tactile sensitivity, or fine, uh, fine motor um, control. Okay? So that's basically how that is organized. We'll come back to this in a, uh, in a second. I'll skip this, except to say um, that there are, within the spinal cord itself, there are several different tracts. First, these are in red here, what are known as the ascending tract of the nervous system, of the, of the spinal cord. That's carrying afferent impulses up the spinal cord to the brain. Okay? Then in blue here, we have the descending tracts of the, uh, in the spinal cord carrying efferent impulses down, okay, it's what's called descending, and out to the motor uh, parts. And then the rest of this basically is uh, um, association tissue. Uh, this is, uh, these are essentially composed of afferent neurons, this tract. These, this tract composed mostly of efferent neurons, and these tracts composed essentially of, uh, of interneurons. Okay, so what happens here is that the spinal cord, okay, is where the brain connects with the rest of the body, where, mess, where the, the brain processes tactile sensations, what you're feeling, what you're touching, and also generates the motions of the legs and the arms and the hands and the, uh, and the nerves. Okay, let's look for a second at the implications of some of this for what happens when somebody suffers a break in the spinal cord, okay? Remember that the spinal cord is carrying afferent impulses up to the brain and it's carrying efferent impulses down from the brain. When there's a break in the spinal cord, those impulses stop. There's no way for them to get across a break in the spinal cord, so that when people suffer a break in the spinal cord, they uh, manifest a neurological syndrome that is known as paraplegia, paraplegia, which involves both a loss of sensory function and a loss of voluntary uh, movement. So if there is a break in the spinal cord here, somewhere in the thoracic division, the person will be able to feel things with his or her hands and move his or her hands because the hands are, move, are, are, are controlled by um, spinal nerves that are above the break, but the person will be paralyzed uh, with respect to the legs and the feet and the toes and will also have no tactile sensation 
from that part of the body. Now, uh, what happens, okay, when, you, when your spinal cord is broken, why don't you just die? Well, the reason for that is, see this vagus nerve that I pointed out before? That's a cranial nerve, okay? Uh, and that is very, very, very high up, and it's the vagus nerve that, that basically keeps uh, the heart uh, and other essential vital functions um, going. Now, when somebody uh, suffers from paraplegia, they lose sensation from the affected part of the body, that is, the part of the body that is below the break in the spinal cord. They also lose voluntary motion, m movement, uh, from uh, in, in areas below the break in the spinal cord. But they do not lose all afferent and efferent processing. Even in cases of paraplegia, you can see maintained some stimulus response connections, and these stimulus response connections are known as the spinal reflexes. And they're known as the spinal reflexes because they are processed solely at the level of the spinal cord itself. Usually, we think about uh, tactile uh, 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 touch sensation coming up the legs, going up the spinal cord to the brain, and the brain generating a motor response that goes down the spinal cord and out the, uh, sp uh, out the spinal nerves. That's true for voluntary motor activities, but there are certain involuntary motor responses, uh, reflex responses, that are processed solely at the level of the spinal cord. One of these is the so-called patellar reflex, which probably all of you have experienced in the doctor's office when you tap the patellar tendon, you're, you get a little jerk reflex um, uh, here. That is a um, common uh, part of a neurological uh, diagnostic uh, test. And that's, that main t remains intact in paraplegic uh, patients, but these spinal um, reflexes have certain kinds of interesting properties. The first is that spinal reflexes in uh, cases of spinal cord injury tend to be exaggerated. They tend to be stronger than spinal reflexes in individuals with an intact spinal cord. It's as if the brain is sending signals down the spinal cord that modulate or dampen the activity of the spinal reflexes. And when the brain can no longer communicate with that part of the spinal cord, the spinal cord, uh, the, the spinal cord is left to its own devices, and it gives a more exaggerated uh, response. Another characteristic of these spinal reflexes is that they are unconscious. Because they're processed solely at the level of the spinal cord, nothing about this activity reaches the brain, which is the seat of consciousness. A person will not know that he or she is engaging in the, a, a paraplegic individual won't be directly aware that he or she is giving one of these spinal reflexes. So if you had a, um, a person with a spinal cord injury and you blindfolded them so they couldn't see what you were doing, tap their patellar tendon, they'd give the patellar reflex, but they would neither feel the tap nor would they be aware of their, uh, of their leg moving. So uh, these spinal reflexes are exaggerated, they're unconscious, and they are also involuntary. Now, with my intact spinal cord, you know, oh, I'm not going to give the patellar reflex, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. See, I didn't do it. But, okay, I've got some voluntary control over this thing, but when there's a break in the spinal cord, that voluntary control is lost because the inhibitory messages can't get down the spinal cord. Moreover, here, I'm not tapping my patellar tendon, moving my leg just fine, can't do that either in case of paraplegia because that requires a signal that's initiated in the brain to go down the spinal cord and it just can't get to, um, to those centers. Okay, so basically that's the story with respect to the uh, somatic nervous system and its branches, the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. Any questions about that? Yeah. Hemiplegia is not usually caused by a break in the spinal cord. Hemiplegia, to, at least to my knowledge, I'll stand corrected uh, over here in a second. Hemiplegia is usually something you see in cases of stroke. 
okay, where a person has had a vascular insufficiency, the blood supply to the brain has been cut off, and some part of the brain has basically been destroyed. And what happens is, in many cases of stroke, uh, that vascular insufficiency affects only one part of the brain or another. And we're not going to discuss this today, we're going to discuss it next Wednesday, but uh, there's a principle of uh, uh, nervous system organization called contralateral projection. Contralateral, okay, other side projection. And to make a long story short, your left cerebral hemisphere controls the right side of your body. Your right cerebral hemisphere controls the left side of your body. So if you had a stroke that has damaged certain centers in your left hemisphere, you'll lose some functions in the right side of the body, but not in the left side of the body. So you'll have weakness. Um, anybody watched, uh, what's this, Senator Tim Johnson last night on the news? Okay, anybody watch the news? Okay, you got to watch the news. Okay, uh, got to watch the Law and Order reruns, but you've also got to watch the news. Um, some of you may remember that uh, Senator Tim Johnson of North Dakota about eight months ago suffered a brain hemorrhage. Not a stroke exactly, but something like a stroke. Uh, and what happened was that um, that um, stroke affected, his, the, uh, the brain hemorrhage was localized in his left cerebral hemisphere. Um, and what it did was to basically wipe out uh, his um, um, sensory tactile and motor functions on the right side, uh, but also, going to talk about this later on too, language functions tend to be localized in the left cerebral hemisphere, so he lost the ability to speak. Now, uh, after eight months of intensive rehabilitation, those of you who saw the news last night saw that Senator Johnson speaks okay, okay? He's not going to give a big speech on the floor of the Senate anytime soon, but he can communicate just fine, all right? Um, but uh, as the, uh, the uh, Tim Johnson, the uh, ABC um, medical consultant, and Sanjay Gupta, the CNN medical consultant, pointed out, he has a lot of weakness on his right side. Uh, he uses a wheelchair. He can get up, but he's very weak on his right side. That's, a con that's kind of a hemiplegia, and it's because the damage was in the left part of his brain. Is that an answer? Sometimes I give you more of an answer than you want, okay? And if it's okay, it's okay. If it's too much, throw an eraser at me or something, and I'll stop. Anything else about paraplegia? Yes, something back here. Uh, ghost pain or phantom limb pain, that's really complicated, okay? It's too, I actually, I know the answer to this, uh, but it's too complicated for me to do in the, in the 11 minutes that are left. In fact, because I've only got about three minutes left, we're going to do an announcement. Would you post that, just as a reminder to me, post that question on the forum in the course website, and I'll give you a, a very clear answer to that, okay? Uh, I had something else down here. Yes? Yeah, the efferent neurons are, for all intents and purposes, connected to muscles in the same way that the afferent neurons are connected to sensory receptors like the retina of the eye and the ear and all of that, okay? Um, so yes, the efferent, the, the reason the efferent muscles work the way they do is because they connect to the muscles. The reason the afferent neurons work the way they do is that they pick up, they, pr they uh, carry sensory impulses that arise in the sensory receptors in the body. Was that what you needed? Okay. Maddie, come on up. I'll take another question or two and we'll, yes. It all depends on the extent of the damage, okay? You can have a, an injury to the spinal cord, okay, that doesn't actually destroy tissue. And you're, there, there's some capacity for nervous, uh, the nervous tissue to recover function. Or you can have a bruise or something, and that will, that will temporarily um, uh, result in that kind of loss of function. We're talking here about a cut in the spinal cord, not an injury, okay? And although there are exceptions, I talk about this a little bit in the lecture supplement, and Gleitman talks about it a little bit in his chapter three. For all intents and purposes, central nervous system damage is permanent. 
gone, gone forever. Okay? So wear your helmets, wear your shoulder pads, and uh, don't jump into anything you don't know what's underneath you. Okay?